So my name is Angela Lambing. I'm a nurse practitioner. For those of you who don't know me, I have been a nurse practitioner for over 35 years. I have to count. Um, I spent over 25 years in the bleeding disorder community. I spent uh, 15 years running the Henry Ford Treatment Center here in Detroit, um, where we dealt with adults um, and we had some youngins, but uh, my predominant average age was like 50. Um, and I took care of guys in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So um, that's my other life of pain, uh, aging issues. So I've um, done a lot of research on pain. Um, after I worked at uh, the treatment center, I spent six years in the pharma industry where um, I worked on pain programs, educating treatment centers on how to manage pain, which I think is still needed. So um, I was asked to come and talk about pain. And my first comment was big topic. What do you want to know? Because I can talk for an hour on a multitude of things. So what we decided to do is really focus on um, complementary therapies, because as we all know, the opioid epidemic is getting a lot of coverage. And um, I think I'm, I am a fan of opioids in the right patient, the right situation, the right dose, everything that's associated with that. Um, and I know that it works in the right situation. I also know it can be abused, but we also need to be open to other alternatives and other ways of managing pain. So is there anyone in the room here who's ever had pain? So you're all in the right place. You are pain-free, sir? All right. Right, because you're in the right place. We'll be talking about, um, I'm going to be go going over the review of the literature of what's out there for pain management in complementary therapies for people with bleeding disorders. Because you think, well, has it ever been used, right? So now I'm going to tell you other stuff out there. But I will qualify that, that most of it is hemophilia. There's a little bit of Von Willebrands. If you have something other than that, there's no research out there, but that doesn't mean that it still isn't an opportunity. So I want you to think about those opportunities of ways to manage pain, okay? I'm gonna be covering a lot of different issues. It's a lot of information. Um, I had to condense quite a bit. So if there's a particular type of therapy you're not really familiar with, with, just let me know and I'll be happy to give you the rundown. In a real world, I'd give a slide, this is what it is, and this is what the research is, but there's not enough, I it's too many slides. So I'm gonna kind of stroll through it. Okay, I know I'm talking to the choir here, but I am gonna cover a little bit of a review of the research. Um, we actually, one of my colleagues and I uh, did one of the first pain studies on bleeding disorders and published it back in 2012. And um, I actually did a review of the literature in 2017, looking at all the complementary therapies for bleeding disorders, and that was published in the Journal of Hemophilia Practice. So when I was asked to talk about it again, I had to go back and review it. And I have to tell you, I was pleasantly surprised in the last five years, there's more out there. So this is good news. People are looking in that direction. We all know that the incidence of pain is evident in hemophilia. And you see there that there's a, a difference of up to 12 to 76%. And this has bared out even in a most recent study that was published this year. Also, if it makes sense, people with hemophilia, if you utilize prophylaxis, they're gonna have less pain than those who don't. Why? Why? Right. You eliminate the bleeds or minimize them, so you're gonna have less pain. But what's also interesting, and this was in um, one of our national pain study and also confirmed in 2016, 40 to 60% of patients report their pain is not well controlled. So we definitely have a problem. And the other thing we found is where do most people go for their pain management? No, hopefully not. Not a good choice, but their treatment center, right? And we would hope that our treatment center is good at managing pain. And what I have learned when I worked in the pharma industry and put together this whole pain program for nurses and doctors and social workers, like hemophilia, you see one hemophilia, you've seen one, right? 
Von Willebrands, you've seen one, you've seen one. Well, apparently when you see one treatment center, you've seen one. They all work very differently. But we did try to educate them. And actually, there's a really big program that I put out last year uh, online for them. All right. So this, um, Dr. Mako Johnson published this at the World Federation uh, meeting in 2016. And what they identified is that people on primary prophylaxis and continuous prophylaxis have less pain than those who do episodic. Perfect sense, right? We understand that. We also looked at kid, young kids. Um, we did 13 to 24 year olds. We did up to 30, we've done older, and we you can see here that uh, pain has interfered with work and housework and daily life. You'll see that uh, we also have some female uh, data here as well, where it's at, um, where they're having some uh, issues with interference with activities and self care. And if you look at the bottom one, you'll notice the pain interference is greater with those over the age of 40 than those in lesser years. Why do you think that is? Pardon? accumulation of damage, right? But you know what? They didn't benefit from Profi, right? Profi's only been around about 30, 35 years. And these guys were always episodic. It wasn't till the world of Profi came around that we would expect less pain and less bleeds. But you'll see they're still having it, even though these guys and these people are on Profi. There's also a study that was done that showed that hemophilia B uh, adults had poorer health status. And I thought this was an interesting statement here. Uh, we were looking at young adults and what we were comparing, and there's another uh, slide that talks about it. We looked at the perception of pain of the individual and their, their, their caregiver, their parents' perception and their treatment center perception, okay? And one of the questions we asked was, how old were you when you started pain medicine? 11 and a half years of age. What's wrong with that picture? Look at the age group. This is the Profi kids, right? They should be having less pain because they're being treated, right? So this really, as if any... Anybody knows anything about research, research begets more research because it asks more questions. I really want to know why that is. I haven't had a chance to explore it. The other part of some one of our studies we identified is that people who are of non-Caucasian descent tend to have higher levels of reported pain and lower physical scores. We're looking at women related to menstruation. This study was done in England in 2021. And you can see 65% of women had painful cycles and had heavy bleeding, um, painful, and even though they were using the treatment that was recommended. Here's that study I was telling you about. Now, do you think that there was good agreement between the patient, their parents, and the provider? No. What was the best? The, the parents had a better understanding, but you can see it was only 29% and the providers were even less. But again, it asks more questions because we're dealing with young adults. Are they not sharing that they're having pain because, oh, I can't play baseball if I have a sore foot. So that might be part of the process. And again, I want to ask that question. One day I'll get to that research. Haven't done it yet. Again, the study done in, in England uh, was published in 2021, and I thought this was interesting, the perceptions that people have uh, with hemophilia, that they feel that pain is normal. Well, I've heard that for many years, and I don't believe that is that should be the perception. I think we need to address it, that there uh, the impact and how we manage pain and other factors influence our pain. Again, our earliest experiences as a child influence how we manage pain. It infects mental health. We already know that. I'll talk about that in a minute. And that I also thought it was interesting. They doubted the value of pain scales. So you know the numeric pain scale zero to 10. It's always been around for years. I know it's not the best scale because my four may not be your four. Right? And when so I had patients that would say their level was four when looking at the level of what I'm seeing, they look like a nine or a 10 to me. So I recognize that it, it had its limits. So we have to look at other ways of assessing pain. I have a sister who recently fell down the stairs and broke her shoulder. Pain scale wasn't working on her. So I had to say to her, all right, look at today, 
because she kept saying, oh, it's been three weeks. I am not better. I don't feel better. And I said, all right, let's look at today. Now, compared to two days ago, how did you feel? Are you 10% better, 25% better, 50%, you know, and that was something she could work with. So we have to look at what pain scales work for individuals. The other thing I found interesting from the study is the perception of the providers that the patients thought they don't, they lack empathy and understanding. I'm not surprised. The therapists, physical therapists are worth their weight in gold people. And that the value of talking about pain is helpful. And I thought, well, that's good to hear. And that there are those psychosocial implications that need to be addressed. And I agree with that too, because recently we're in research, we're actually looking at that. And here we go. So studies have shown, and you see there's at least eight of them there that identify that people with bleeding disorders uh, admit that they have levels of depression. And that a recent study this year confirms that that the biggest risk is among men with hemophilia, especially if they don't have social support or they're not employed. So we know that people who are depressed with a bleeding disorder with hemophilia are less likely to complete high school, less likely to follow their plan for therapy, more likely to have joint pain and limitation, more likely to lack social support or be unemployed. Anxiety is another issue. Now, the thing is, is this a bad thing? We now know that all of this is interrelated. So the issue is, is how do we manage that? Acknowledge it and work with it. Again, anxiety is documented uh, in the literature, even up to 67%, again, confirmed in a recent study this year. But I thought this was interesting, mothers of hemophilia kids. So mothers with hemophilia kids had more anxiety and depression than those who had no medical issues with their children. Yeah, well, we worry about our kids anyways, right? But when they have a, a health issue, we worry more. I had kids with asthma. I worried about my kids with asthma, especially when the colds came and you saw the cough coming and the whole thing. Mother's depression and anxiety scores, though, were associated with children's depression and anxiety scores. So we're really dealing with a whole family here. I thought this was interesting, uh, a study done by the HERO, uh, it was the HERO-B study, that uh, women with he hemophilia B had more reported more anxiety and depression than men. So what do we know? They're all interrelated. We know that it affects a lot of different things, and in the end result, it can affect our treatment of how we manage our own health, and we need to work through that, and that um, it affects our social activities, but we need to continue to do research to figure out how are we going to put all this information together and improve the management of it. So what I want to talk about now is the general pain pathway, and this is kind of a standard view. So I want you to think about it as, here's a picture of a knee. So um, like for instance, I have a knee bleed. So that message gets sent to the spine, up to the brain. The brain goes, oh, knee bleed. I need to do X, Y, Z. And it comes back down and does the, and tells the, the knee what to do. Now, another perfect example that's a little bit more immediate. You put your hand on a hot stove. That message goes up to the brain. The brain goes, hot stove, take your hand off. And you take your hand off because it goes right back down. It all happens very quickly. So we have these pain pathways that tend to get very ingrained. And when we ingrain them like that, sometimes we have negative outcomes because we have negative thoughts associated with them happening the same way. And our job is to change how those pathways occur. The actual thing to think about too is that we have an opportunity to manage pain, not just at the site, but along the spinal cord and the nerves and up in the brain. The brain is the most powerful organ we have. And we have an opportunity if we can work how we think about things, then we can affect change in how we perceive and manage our pain. Going to give you another a perfect example. Quite a few years ago, I was on a, a plane going to um, uh, Vegas. Now, you know, it was a long time ago because they serve food. Okay. I was a young in at the time, uh, but I was practicing nurse practitioner and I'm sitting there. It was just after a meal. And I see this little old lady about 70 with white hair go whipping up the aisle. And I'm going, darn, she's moving fast. There's something going on. And then she comes whipping back with the stewardess. So I thought, all right, I got to go find out what's going on. And her 
seatmate after eating was having abdominal cramping, was feeling uncomfortable, and she ends up passing out. And so the stewardess is in amongst the seat, right? And I'm in the aisle. And, and I said to the stewardess, you got to lie her down. You got to lie her down. So what does the stewardess do? She takes her legs and puts them up on the seat and her head is up against the window. So she's sitting like this, not working, is it? To this day, I have no recollection. I have no recollection of how I got from the aisle into that seat area, but I did. I got in there, whipped her down, and she woke up right away, okay? Continue on, we get to the hotel. I sit down and I put my hands on my lap and I went, oh, oh gee, my leg hurts. And I looked at my leg and I had a bruise this big, the color of your blue outfit. So I significantly injured, you know, bruised my leg. No recollection, no pain until I touched it. What was my brain doing? So that's the message. Think about that, that I was able to do something. Yes, ma'am. Right. And you forget about it. And then it starts to show, but this was a significant bruise. Like I had it for months. So I, I really damaged, but I had no recollection and it didn't hurt for two hours. So again, our brain is functioning in a way to protect us. And if we can harness that energy, and that's where some of this cam therapy comes in, which is what we're going to talk about. I think my pain tolerance is higher though, in general. So maybe that was part of it. So let's talk about these non-farm options. Let's do, what is the definition of CAM? Uh, that's complementary and alternative medicine. Complementary meaning used with, alternative used in place of, or integrated as a combination. And quite frankly, the third option is the best option because we don't want to totally ignore traditional medicine, but we want to incorporate convention, like the complementary with that conventional medicine to have, find the best fit. So complementary alternative therapy has been around for a while. Um, back in 2014, this is U.S. data. You can see that up to, and I'm sure it's increased even more now. Um, a lot of adults and children used it. Um, and why? Well, they felt the traditional therapies weren't really working. They wanted to avoid side effects. So like people are, I don't want to take pain medicines. I want to look at other ways. Um, they want to see about managing their pain holistically, have control over it, and feel that there's, it's patient-centered, where they're working with their therapy, treatment center and so forth. So this is all okay. There was a study published by uh, Jadhav, and this is in India in 2013, where he actually documented the amount of CAM therapy that is used in India. Why do you think it's so high? Anybody? You have to talk loud so I can hear you. There's not a lot of factor there. So they have to come up with alternative therapies. The other thing to think about too is out in the East, they are the wizards of complementary therapy. Like a lot of that stuff started in, in Asia and in India. And I'll give you some examples. Here's the national pain study. This was done when we published in 2012. And I know it might not be easy to see, but one of the things we looked at is what kind of therapies were people using for acute and persistent pain? And there's a whole list of stuff. And you can see there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. So acupuncture, relaxation, hypnosis, biofeedback, all the things we're going to talk about. Massage was the, relaxation was the highest one used, massage and faith and prayer. So um, I would love to repeat this and see if we get the same numbers. There are four domains to complementary therapy, and we're going to go through each one, and I'm going to review the literature. So let's start with that mind-body therapies. And why? Because I think it's the most important one, and a brain has the power to control what we do. And it helps us in how we interact and, and uh, process that pain. There's a list there, and uh, I actually just updated it because there's a new buzzword that you're going to see, which is called the pain reprocessing theory. Um, that just has come out this year. And basically what it is, is helping your body understand how you're viewing your pain and redirecting and reprocessing how that is managed. It's, it's very similar to um, neuroplasticity, which you may have heard of, um, but it has to do with retraining your brain. 
So when, as I mentioned earlier, we have that pain experience and we, if we have, and we're continually fighting these pain processes, the, this, this pathway, fire, 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 and it gets ingrained and we need to change that and how we rethink that. And that's where these particular practices can help our body and our minds to rethink how we process and think about pain. So keep that in mind. We talked a little bit about neuroplasticity, but what was interesting, it was actually uh, talked about in 2018 um, to help with um, conceptualizing pain. So again, that's the first time I've actually seen it published. Cognitive reframing is a very similar process that I'm talking about. It's how we re, uh, balance how we think about our pain. And uh, Dr. Elander out of England uh, was a, with hemophilia patients, was able to identify that uh, using cognitive reframing, reduce pain intensity, reduce negative thoughts. And in 2021, a controlled study study, 19 people, which is good, which showed an improvement in how they manage pain, their self-esteem and their emotional status. So I thought that was a pretty good, um, we're seeing some changes that was not there previously. It needs a trained therapist. You need to find a trained therapist in cognitive reframing and biofeedback, and they work through that process with you. Sort of like when you do meditation, you know, like if you have somebody that trains you in it, then then you can learn to do it yourself. So it's the same kind of process. So you have to find somebody. All right. Biofeedback, long time it's been around. Anyone not know what biofeedback is? Okay, no problem. We actually did this at National Hemophilia one year. We brought in a specialist. He was a, a psychotherapist who used biofeedback. We hooked people up to different measurements. Like for instance, he had a, a thing on his finger that measured his pulse and you could hear this pulse, tone, tone, beep, beep, beep put him through progressive relaxation with the understanding that as the more you relax, the slower your heart rate goes, you hear that pulse instantly and get that immediate feedback that you're in doing the right thing, but you need a trained professional to help you work through it. And so back in 81, they had some case studies in 84, they showed some improvement. And in 2006, they also thought, and then actually WHF, um, a world federation, recommended it as uh, an additional use of pain management. You all familiar with distraction? <laughs> Lots of ways, playing with your dog, watching TV, uh, listening to music, the list is endless. Um, my example is um, when I was working one day, uh, we had um, take your child to work day. And uh, for those of you who happen to live in Detroit, Red Wings are the, the hockey team, okay? And back then they were hot. And um, he was with me and one of my patients is a major hockey fan as well. And I said, go in and talk to him about hockey. And for 20 minutes, they were so animated having this intense discussion. And when he came out, I said to my son, you just distracted him for 20 minutes from his pain because he had a lot of pain issues. So that's a, that's a simple example, but there's a lot of different things that you can do that will help. So again, Dr. Elander also has done work with distraction and found that there was some opportunity to influence how we think about pain and that intensity and improve it. And what's interesting is Dr. Dunn out of Nationwide Children in Ohio did a study in 2017 with virtual reality glasses. You know what I'm talking about? You ever tried those? They're like, you're, like your brain is working in a whole different way because you're seeing things differently. What she did is she put through the, them on these glasses so these kids were distracted while they were getting stuck with needles, you know, like uh, getting a, a blood draw. And it showed a significant uh, positive distraction influence. I actually read a study where they were looking at um, – soldiers who had significant burns and you know burn therapy can be quite painful and they use virtual reality glasses that put these soldiers through a cold environment like they were in the snow and the ice and they were able to uh, get through their therapy with much less pain so again our brain is taking over here and we have an opportunity to make a difference anyone try yoga nobody oh come on people you need to give it a try What's that? Well, the thing is, is um, it. I, 
I've seen some really positive results with it. And I know that, you know, some people might have limitations physically. So like there's chair yoga and there's different ways that you can um, modify uh, the yoga to work for you. But consistent use of it, it improves your balance, improves your core, your strength, and can actually reduce pain. And I have used it and it's worked really well for me. And uh, it actually is supported by the World Federation as well. And then, of course, a study in 2015 felt that it was helpful to 2020. They also used it where they, with kids, they felt, felt that attendance reduced because they had less bleeding. And then uh, in 2022, they talked about how yoga helped improve quality of life in the youth. So we're seeing some improvement. And yoga has been around for how long? And I've seen some good results out of it. We're all familiar with relaxation and meditation. Again, um, you can get different things like apps, books, but sometimes it's helpful to help someone teach you how to do it so that you can better do it on your own. You can see it's gone way back in 75 and 81, where they showed that it helped to control their perceived pain, decrease their pain perception. But lo and behold, in 2021, in the bottom, they actually looked at 80 people with hemophilia A and B who were able to reduce their pain intensity, improve their pain and perception and the pain acceptance. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there to help us um, manage our pain. What do y'all think about hypnosis? Yay, nay. Oh, you're, you're the shaking of a head. You got a, a yes. I'm gonna give you my aha moment. Um, I had taken my kids, our, our, we had taken our children on a cruise. My son was 17. He was the oldest and they had a, hypnot a professional hypnotist performer on the cruise ship. Now, my son has ADHD. And all I can think of is this brain is like this, right? He's in 10 different directions. But he decided he wanted to be one of the participants. And I'm like, no way are they going to hypnotize this kid. Now, keep in mind, hypnosis has to be by a trained professional. And, and it's a form of relaxation and things like that. And my aha moment was when he there was sitting like a dozen of them sitting there. And he was sitting in the chair. And as he progressively relaxed, he put his face in the chest of the woman next to him. My son would never have done that. And I just went, oh my God, he's hypnotized. But we're not done yet. So they put him through, you know, some fun movements. And then at the end, they did some post-hypnotic suggestions. And one of them was like, you're gonna feel really good and stuff like that. And he came back and sat down and I said, so how do you feel? He goes, you know, I feel really good. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. And then um, as we're talking, the performer did another suggestion. And in the middle of the conversation, he stood up and yelled, I'm the captain of this ship. And I say free hot dogs for everyone. Sat back down and carried on the conversation. <laughs> that was my moment when I realized if we can harness the brain into how we think of things and how we perceive things that we can improve how we feel. And if they can harness him, we can harness anybody, right? So, but the thing is, is it has been done. At an NHF, and I can't remember how many years ago, we brought a hypnotist in and we hypnotized a dozen treatment center nurses. They were all hypnotized, I'm telling you. And again, the reason for that, it was to open your mind to alternative ways of managing how you think and uh, work through pain. So you can see way back in 75, and you know, there's a couple of uh, suggestions there that identify that it helped to reduce their uh, pain and level of distress. And in uh, actually 2021, they actually did a random controlled trial where they, uh, with 20 young individuals and found that it did improve their pain uh, interference, that it might be actually a promising intervention with little harm. So keep your mind open, it lasted up to three months for many of the individuals. And then they actually, uh, in 2021, they looked at seven hypnosis trials and looked, and that there are over 300 people with hemophilia. So this is a lot more information in several different countries. And they found that all the treatments were safe. There were no major side effects. And there was an improvement of self-efficacy and better self-management skills of their pain. So think about this, people. The brain is a powerful organ and it does wonderful things. How many of you have heard of Buzzy? B. 
Have you tried it or um, has it worked for someone you know or yourself? No, it didn't work. Okay. So the thing to keep in mind when we're talking about pain, we all know pain is a personal experience, right? My pain is not your pain. What works for me may not work for you. What works for you may not work for me. And you don't know until you try it. The Buzzy Bee is a vibratory device and there's two ways to use it. This picture shows like a cold pack where you can put it right on the site for kids where it'll numb it and the vibratory sensation is a level of distraction where they can actually do a needle poke on that site or they can use it in the opposite arm for a distraction elsewhere. There's no research studies, but a lot of treatment centers swear by it. Okay, anyone heard of magic glove? You can look it up online. It's a form of meditation. It's where you do a progressive relaxation and you walk through putting on a glove, looking at all the five senses. And it's a numbing technique where they can access and um, manage it. There was a study done in 2019 with 14 patients that showed a reduction in pain perception. So again, it's that mind control and management. So let's talk about some of those manipulative and body based practices. And you can see there's a lot there. This has to do things like acupressure, manipulation, pool therapy, massage. We're going to talk about all those. Chiropractic right now, there's no research study that talks about it with people with bleeding disorders. So I can't really comment on it, but I, my brother uses it regularly and he swears by it. Okay. Uh, reflexology, anyone know what that is? Not know what it is. You know, it's where you have the trigger points on the foot and that if they hit those right points, it can affect the pain experience in other parts of the body. There was a study that was uh, provided in 2013. It was actually just a discussion where they looked at, um, uh, recommended it for hep C and HIV patients with hemophilia. We well know that rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation can be helpful, right? How many has put, how many of you put ice on an injury and it hurts more? Clearly that is not the one for you. And so then you have to look at what, what does work. I've had patients that works well. I've, I've had others that intensifies the pain. Same with an ACE wrap where you can give it support. Some people feel that it increases the pain. So you have to find the right mix for you. Um, Angela Forsyth is a well-known physical therapist in the hemophilia community who actually did a, a, a discussion and publication about whether or not ice is actually the best thing as it affects the coagulation and hemostasis in that area and whether we need to look at heat or ice in the right situation. Manipulation therapy is kind of like where you take the joint and, and, and you massage and manipulate the muscles specifically specifically surrounding that particular area. So in 2018, um, there was a study that, uh, a case study that looked that it could be safe. In 2020, they looked at 65 hemophilia patients where they did fascial therapy specifically on the joint where they're manipulating and working with the joint. Uh, it's like a combination of massage and range of motion and found a positive effect. And in 2021, they worked on just uh, elbows and found some good results. How many of you have had a really good massage? And how many of you have had a bad one? I've done both. And what made it bad? Right. So what happened when you're dealing with massage therapy, it can be very beneficial, but you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing, right? And what I have found is, you know, you have a muscle area that needs to loosen up and darn, they're going to get that knot out, right? And they leave you battered and bruised when you're done. That's not the best way to approach it. There are like in the Detroit area, we do have, I know there's a, a massage therapist who is a mild hemophilia. She is, has kids with hemophilia and she's really good at what she does because she understands the disease state. But you can see it's been around 2010, 2013, they have some documented. In 2019, they used it on joints post-surgery, uh, scar tissue. And then in 21, they recommended it that it might be helpful, but said that you should have factor first. So again, I think that makes sense or whatever treatment you're using that you're topped up, um, but also that you have somebody who knows what they're doing and recognizes the, the positive of what they can do. And a good massage therapist um, is worth their weight in gold. 
um, I had an IT band issue where that um, ligament uh, was causing me problems where I could hardly walk. And I went to a sports medicine therapist and boy, oh boy, he hit that spot and he managed to work it and massage it and relax it. And I was able to relieve my pain. It was well worth it. What do y'all think about acupuncture? Bleeding disorder, needles, doesn't seem to fit, right? Okay, well, I have an aha moment for that one too. I had gone to China and toured many hospitals. One of them was a traditional hospital where they used traditional therapies, not conventional like what were Western medicine. I witnessed them doing acupuncture on people as a form of pain management prior to minor surgical procedures. That's all they got. They did fine. And I went, gee, that's something to think about. And I actually came back and I had one particular um, hemophilia patient. Um, he was in his fifties, had a lot of problems, a lot of pain. I was, I was constantly struggling to try to manage his pain. We're, we're looking at different therapies and I went, we're going to try acupuncture. What do you think? And of course he's already on Profi. So we're good with that. And we always did it on the day he got his dose and he used to walk like this on a wheel with a wheelchair to see me. He had one therapy, came to see me. He was walking upright. I did not know that man was six feet tall. And he felt it tremendously better. So I'm like, okay, here's an opportunity that we can make a difference. And you can see that there were some case reports in 81, 2002. And then in 2006, they had 12 pay, uh, patients where quite a few felt a reduction in pain. But keep in mind, here in 2008, they did report a case where they gave adequate factor, but the person still developed a hematoma. So again, we have to balance that risk. You have to, and of course, acupuncture, you need somebody who knows what they're doing, right? They have to be trained. And a lot of these people are all regulated. I did a study myself in Detroit using our counterpart uh, twinning program in India. And they had an acupuncturist in India who had his own hospital, a freestanding hospital, and all he did was offer acupuncture. And I went to visit it, and I'll tell you, it was amazing what he was doing. I saw before videos, after videos, and he treated a variety of different therapies, but uh, of different issues. And I was just amazed at the success of what he had. So what we did, very small, you know, there were, we only had six in the U.S. We could only get three in India because they had to travel there and it was hard to get there. And of course, they didn't have factor because there was less available. And our um, internal review board insisted we have factor prior to therapy, which makes sense. And you see, seven out of nine had an improvement, whether they were were from India or the US and nobody had any bleeding or bruising. So again, an opportunity to think about it. And then in 2014, there was a case report of a type three uh, Von Willebrands that used acupuncture for migraines without any problems. So again, open mind, think about these other opportunities. Does anyone not know what a TENS unit is? Y'all know what it, it's okay if you don't, I'll tell you, but if I need to tell you, I can save my, my words for something else. Anyone not know? Okay. Transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator. So basically what it is, it's a little like iPod thing and it has uh, leads on it and patches and you put these patches on your skin in certain areas and it emits an electrical stimulation and it, you can affect the intensity and the frequency of it. The idea behind it is that it'll help you identify different pain pathways, but also as a level of distraction. Um, I've had patients that worked really well with, it looked, you're shake, uh, nodding like it worked well with you. Um, I've had other patients where it didn't do anything for them. Uh, I actually, I have a sister who has some um, nerve issues in her spine and I gave it to her and she's been using it and she's able to sit now when she couldn't before. So, and cause she wanted to drive a long distance and this was able to get her through it. And you have control over that intensity because obviously the higher you go, the more painful it is. So you have to dial it to what something is com uh, comfortable to you. So use the 1985 
used in uh, 2018 and most recently in 2020, they actually compared it to acupuncture and found that acupuncture was as effective. Now, one has less of a potential bleed risk, right? Because you're not inserting needles. But again, I want you to keep open to that possibility that there are other options out there. What do y'all think about hydrotherapy? Like sitting in a hot tub, a pool, wonderful, right? Right temperature gives you the buoyancy to allow you to manipulate and move those muscles. Well documented. I'm not going to go into detail. Think about it. Use it. It's well worth it. Physical therapy, those therapists are worth their weight in gold. And if I know, you know, sometimes it might hurt when you first start, but if they, you get them in the right spot and they're doing the right stuff, you do get improvement and it is well documented as well. And then braces for the right situation, I think they can be helpful. So um, this particular author looked at a review of the literature just to look at physical ther uh, physiotherapy interventions in general. And the, the end result is, is that one, when I look at this, there's no clear, more positive. It's, it's again, a personal benefit that may affect you. So let's talk about natural products. What are natural products? Things like vitamins, herbs, essential oils, aromatherapies. They're typically found in nature. They're known to have some anti-inflammatory relaxation qualities. They can be taken orally, applied to, uh, on the skin as an essential oil. You can inhale it. The big difference I want you to be aware of is that they're not as closely monitored by the FDA. So we all, I always question it, if you get a vial of something, is it what it says it is? What else is in there? And do we know what potential interactive effects can be? and whether or not there might be in potent, increased potential for bleeding. The thing is you have to do your research. And the other aspect is you need to have frank conversations with your treatment center. Never do any of this without having some input and discussion and a plan, okay? So um, I have to tell you that um, vitamins was not on my radar for looking at a way of managing pain. So I did a little research and I'll tell you what I found. Of course, nothing regarding bleeding disorders, but vitamin C, it's water soluble. You can take as much as you want, you pee out the rest. But there were some clinical trials in cancer and uh, non-cancer uh, pain issues and help uh, fibromyalgia that they thought it was helpful. Low risk, okay might find it helpful. Vitamin D, now that is a fat soluble volume. What that means is you can take too much because it stays in your fat tissues and you, it can get toxic. So uh, it is known to have anti-inflammatory effects. There have been studies that show that people with low vitamin D levels have more pain. Um, and then it, it particularly is better if their vitamin D is low and they increase it, that their pain symptoms can be improved. But again, there's a study in 2019 that said no difference. All right. How many of you are on vitamin D at all? Not all. You all? Okay. Any, do you know what your level is? You do. Good. Right. So, all right. So you're taking something. Do you know, are you normal now? Because that's what you need to know. You're good. You're getting there. The thing is, is the country has done the best job in telling people to stay out of the sun to protect from skin cancer, but we're losing our vitamin D. Vitamin D is essential for bone health, along with everything else. Pretty much everybody I know is low in vitamin D. And one year when I was working at the treatment center, everybody was getting their vitamin D screen and we were up in everybody and, and, you know, maximizing, but there was some stories that did show that there might be some pain improvement, just throwing it out there. Vitamin E, also you can take too much because it stays in the system. It's not washed out. We know that uh, fish oil can be part of that. And we also know that there can be some increased bleeding with it. But the issue is there's a study there in 2020 that said there's no difference. So again, it might work for some people. It might not. You need to talk to your treatment center, look at that risk benefit profile. B12 is another uh, one that was found to be helpful for painful conditions. I actually took B12 uh, when I was much younger, dealing with um, PMS symptoms, and I started. I actually had side effects. I started getting numb from the knee down because I had too much. So yeah, 
interesting to be watchful for. So herbal products. Unfortunately, you can't see them all because it's not in the uh, slideshow mode because that is over top of it. But it's a huge list. And we know that there can be bleeding issues. We don't always know what those drug-drug interactions. I can tell you that when I had these conversations with my patients, there are websites that are building that give more information all the time. So they're telling you what are potential interactions and side effects so that you can have that discussion. I had a patient who used to eat chili peppers to manage his pain. He just popped them, popped them, popped them, popped. Well, all I could think of was my stomach would be in agony. Well, not his. And he felt it managed his pain. Now we had a conversation. He didn't have any side effects. He felt a benefit. We watched him. Okay, go at it if it helps. Okay. So um, there was a review of dietary supplements for musculoskeletal pain done in 2019. And what they kind of looked at is you'll see that first one, they're saying it's, it's sort of recommended. And there's the list, capsaicin, curcuma, which is a turmeric, ginger, glucosamine, melatonin, that sort of thing. Against recommendation, be, uh, they're saying don't use it and no recommendations. They don't have any idea what they want to do with those yet. So um, they did do a research of herbals in people with bleeding disorders in 2021. And there was some mixed evidence, as I've just described, there might be benefits and risks to it. But you'll see there's a list there that say that it's rated as well-established for traditional use, willow bark, frankincense, comfrey root, uh, or rampion, or known as devil's claw, that might be helpful. Keep in mind, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm letting you know there's options out there. You have to work through that process to find out what's best for you. And then, of course, they do talk about the, the particular garlic and ginkgo and ginseng, which we know to have increased potential bleeding risk. The other thing, too, is I've had patients where they say, I want to try ginseng. Well, we know it can increase bleeding. Do you want to try it? Yep. All right. Let's monitor you and see how you do and then work through it that way. Now, I can spend a whole hour talking about cannabis, but, you know, I know people want to know about it, so we're going to just hit the highlights. If you want to know more about it, I did do a talk through NHF. If you Google it, or I think it's on YouTube, I was recorded, and there is an hour-long session on cannabis. But having said that, the laws are rapidly changing, and even my slide today, I found out that yesterday, another state changed its laws. So what I'm showing you is not accurate because that's how fast it's changing. So um, this is just an idea of that history. So if you look at the very beginning, back in the 1800s, the U.S. got it in their pharmacopoeia uh, uh, saying, hey, you know, we need to monitor this. And then in the 70s, they put it as a controlled substance. Uh, but guess what? In 96, California is always ahead of the game. Let's make it available for compassionate use. And then in 2014, way to go, Colorado. They are the ones that have the most dispensaries out there and, um, you know, having it used for recreational use. And then you'll notice in 2019, they're actually directing research to the area. But look at 2016, the FDA approved a marijuana-based drug. That was a drug specifically used for seizures in pediatric patients. So they, you know, it does get approved, right? Um, uh, but then this year is when things have been happening. So the House of Representatives in April passed an act which want to remove it from the Controlled Substance Act because there it was like high uh, risk of uh, diversion, high risk of abuse. We don't want anyone to have it. Sort of up there with heroin and ecstasy. And then now they're allowing states to determine their own laws, but we're waiting it to be further passed on through their regulatory body. And I just saw... Biden had recently uh, decriminalized um, marijuana so that people are going to be let out of jail. They're not going to be fined as much. So we're seeing a lot of changes going on. And I think that landscape is going to look even more different next year. Um, and I have to say, I was never a fan of cannabis myself, but as I was working in the pain field, I saw people who abused it and I saw people who used it responsibly and had good pain relief with it. 
So we had to work at accepting what was going to work for them. Here is what the states are that are legal. So the thing you have to keep in mind, uh, illegal is right here. So if you're in Colorado where it's fully legal, and that's just like uh, both medical and CBD, and you cross into Nevada, you could be into big problems if you got it in your pocket. So you need to be aware of where you are and what those uh, legalities are and when you're crossing state lines. And again, this is a moving target. We're going to see some differences. But just to let you know, there are two types. Marijuana cannabis indica is typically the one that has the tetrahydrocannabidiol, the THC. That's the one where we get the high. And nowadays, it is so well regulated and the way they braid it in labs that they're able to get such high levels of THC and actually control and dispense different milligrams, which might be helpful. And then the cannabis sativa is typically the hemp, which has less THC, but I just had somebody tell me that they're now working at infusing higher levels of THC into the, uh, the hemp version. So again, moving target, all right? There's three types of administration, inhalation, which is the fastest. I'm not a fan of that because I th think that, of course, smoking causes issues in our lungs. So, so can cannabis. You don't know what else is other particulates that are in there that can affect our lungs. There are treatments, uh, topical like ointments and creams. CBD is typically the lowest THC. But again, as I said, they're increasing that THC amount. So you might have something on a topical level. And then of course there's oral ingestion where you can use edibles, uh, tinctures or drops. I think tinctures and drops have a benefit because they're very regulated, like three drops gives you this amount and you know exactly what you're getting. It's very concentrated. Um, there, it, if you're taking it uh, orally, it's very unpredictable because of your acid content. And I'm going to give you a story about this. <laughs> So my sister decided that, and I have many sisters, by the way, <laughs> who wanted to try some cannabis to help her sleep better at night. So her young son goes, oh, I have some THC butter for you. And so she goes, okay. And she, she makes a pan of brownies. What was the first mistake? Pardon? Well, no, we haven't gotten there yet. First mistake. How much THC was in the butter? I don't know. She didn't know either. Like there's a difference if it's 30 versus 150, right? So she makes the brownies. She has a piece. How big is the piece, right? Again, how much is in there? Variability and how it is processed. She waits an hour. She takes another. Waits an hour. Takes another. Both her and her husband. She is circling around the toilet and her husband's passed out in bed. And she's calling her friend going, there's something wrong with this stuff. Don't take it. And I'm like, what is the matter with you? There's a way to do this. So she has switched to tinctures and uh, drops and she's much, and now she knows exactly what she's getting and everything's cool. <laughs> so the message there is, is you got to know what you're doing. And I have to tell you, I'm not a fan of gummies. Why? because they look like candy and we need to keep this stuff away from children. We need to keep all of our meds away from children. And I think just last week, there was a big case of a, a young child who got into somebody's cannabis gummy, gummies and died. So we, we need to make sure that all, all that stuff is kept in a safe place. So be responsible, talk to your treatment center to kind of work through what might be best for you. Make sure you know the laws. Make sure you research where you get it from, because now you need to, like, they should be able to tell you where they got it from, what source. Like, I have a, a, a cannabis plant down the road from me. It's all locked and everything. Nobody gets in. But that's very well regulated because they now can make it in very precise milligrams and and it's approved. So is it approved by the FDA? What are the dosages? And we also have to think about those other contaminants that could be in there, fungus, metals. Are they looking at them? Who's removing them and, and monitoring that? And you have to think about that if you grow your own because you can get fungus and not realize it. And you're now in smoking that if that's what you choose to do. So start slow, go slow, store safely, make sure you're starting. You don't, you know, 
decide to operate uh, heavy machinery until you know what's going on and really be well aware of what your laws are. And then if you're going to do your own plants, know that there's a limit as to how many you can grow your own. So moving on again, that's my five minute take on an hour long conversation. Essential oils. Has anyone ever tried them? Do you find it helpful to you? It didn't work for you. Anybody else? Okay. You know how some people use like lavender for sleep? That would not work for me. I cannot stand the smell of that stuff. Yeah, yeah it doesn't work. But um, some people find that there's some benefit to it, but they are compounds extracted from plants. So you're getting that essence. It's aromatic. Um, it, can, um, it can be put in an oil where you can either smell it or it can be applied. Currently, no research studies uh, for people with bleeding disorders, but it has been studied in other disease states, which I've seen that um, where again, we're seeing good results and others where it's like, hey, no difference. So aromatherapy is very similar where you're inhaling that essential oil. Again, no studies, but in 2013, there was one reported where they used aromatherapy to manage HIV and then uh, hepatitis C. So let's move on to energy therapies. These are things that we look at um, where we're, we're looking at, it's kind of Eastern medicine again, where that vital life energy flows through the body, unlocking and restoring balance. And we're looking at applying pressure or laying of hands over energy fields and redirecting, okay? Typically that seems like a very low risk, right? Because there's less risk of bleeding, you're not injecting anything, you're not inhaling anything. Um, the Hemophilia of Georgia blog in 2012 talked about how they used Reiki uh, after, for somebody after a car accident to manage pain and found it to be helpful. Does everyone know what Reiki is? It's kind of a laying of hands where you're redirecting that energy flow over the body. And there are people who are trained to do this. And then therapeutic touch is where you're actually touching the body. It's a similar system um, and a one case study report in 2013, but again, it was for management of hep C, nothing related to um, bleeding or hemophilia that I can talk about at this point in time. And then of course there's others like color therapy, polarity therapy, magnet therapy, light therapy, not really a lot out there, uh, but in 2015, there was a study of 30 boys where they looked at exercise with lasers and electromagnetic therapy. And they found that the laser therapy to the joints was better than electromagnetic therapy. I think there's a low risk there, um, might be something to think about. Um, I can't say yay or nay, but if somebody came to me and said, hey, I wanna try this, I'd say, hey, let's do some research and look and see what the benefits and the risks are. And then of course, in our national pain study, there's a lot of people up to 30% that looked at prayer and their own faith as a way to manage pain. So um, I wanna touch a little bit, and this is off the beaten path, it's not complementary therapies, but I think they're important, is talking about topical therapies. So there's three different types. There's the non-steroidals. These are things that have, like we're traditionally told not to use, aspirin, Motrin, Aleve, Excedrin, right? Those are the ANSAIDs. But when you use them, um, on a topical solution or an ointment or a patch. And you see, there's a couple of examples there. Um, I used to uh, do ketoprofen gel. I'd have a pharmacy mix it for my patients and they applied it just to the site. It tends to stay right there. Very little bit goes into the systemic uh, circulation that can increase the risk of bleeding. I've had patients who've had great results with it and I've had patients who felt they bled more with it. So again, you don't know if you don't try, right? Um, typically, ANSAIDs are not recommended for people with bleeding disorders. But in the last five years, I'm seeing a, a trend. Um, now that we're focusing on buffing up and optimizing therapy where there's a minimal bleed risk, they're kind of entertaining bringing non-steroidals back in because that bleed risk should be less because you're fully pumped up with your treatment. Um, so I'm seeing some treatment centers going back to that. Uh, again, it's a, a discussion you have to have individually. Um, I recall having uh, like patients, Von Willebrands and, you know, say for instance, 
happens if you get an injury and say you have a sprain? We know that a non-steroidal reduces pain and inflammation and can be very effective. And so I'll say to them, all right, well, a sprain that we need treatment for maybe a week to get you over the hump. What happens when we give you Motrin? Well, I bruise more. How much do you bruise more? Well, not too bad. Would you be willing to undertake, like try the Motrin for a week, knowing you're going to bruise more and we'll keep an eye on you. So that's the kind of conversation you need to have. The other thing I need for you to be aware of is as we get older, non-steroidal therapies like aspirin, Motrin, Aleve, et cetera, are not recommended beyond the age of 65. The risk being higher risk of cardiovascular vascular disease uh, events and bleeding. So if that isn't a reason to think about some other therapies out there to be well managed in so that you can minimize the use of some of those, this might be something to think about. There are counter irritants such as biofreeze and icy hot. I've had patients, some that say, hey, it works great and others didn't do a thing. And then local anesthetics, lidocaine, um, like Ben Gay has a little bit of uh, benzocaine in it and lidoderm. You can get them in patches or ointments. I've had good su success with some and not. A couple things to think about. If you're putting it on with your hands, make sure you wash your hands because you're going to numb other things. So you just have to be conscious of that. But there are other therapies out there. I didn't bring this up with the last group, but, um, you know, oh, opioids are out there and we know they've gotten a bad rap. And I agree, it's not always the best solution for certain situations. Having said that, I have used them and I have had patients do very well with them. For the number of patients I've uh, managed pain, and we're talking well over a hundred, I can count on one hand the problems I've had, but it should not color the ones who actually need it. And I'll give you an example. Because I have lots of them, right? And it, it's non-hemophilia, but it still relates, right? Uh, one of my sisters who has Parkinson's fell down the stairs and broke her shoulder. Nasty, right? Motrin is not going to cut it. Tylenol, not going to cut it. And I said to her, you go right to the doctor and you need something for pain. Well, the doctor orders short-acting morphine and long-acting morphine. So she calls me up. So do I take one of each right now? And I'm like, no, <laughs> because our bodies are all unique and how we process our medicine and whatever we ingest in our bodies is different. There's a uh, situation, it's called the CYP cytochrome system in the liver. Everything we ingest passes through there. So if you took morphine, it might work well for you. If you took it, it wouldn't do nothing. If you took it, it you put you on the floor, you know, like everybody's unique. And I didn't know what she was going to do. So I said to her, take one short acting. I'll call you in two hours because we know how long it's going to take effect. I called her in two hours. I don't feel any better. I said, take another. And she goes, but the pill bottle says every four hours. I said, I understand. Take another. So then she started to get a little bit relief. And then I said, okay, now you can take a long acting in the morning. And then we'll, pro and then she was doing fine with it. Then She's now three weeks in. And of course, she's expecting a much quicker recovery. And we're all telling her, you got a long road here. You know, it, like we're all not even halfway yet. And she says to me, my husband doesn't want me to take the pain medicine. He's worried I'm going to be addicted. And I said, here's what you do. You throw him down the stairs and you tell him, ask him when he wants to stop his pain medicine. And I'll tell you, I have had so many physicians in the hospital try to tell patients to you need to stop or you need to cut back. Let's look at what's going on people. And so what I did is I said to her, all right, how, we're now like three weeks. How much are you taking now? And thank God she listened to me and wrote everything down. So she could go back and say, I took this much. And I said, okay, that's less than when you were last week, you're actually getting better. And in time you will need less and you will be fine. But there are some people who abuse it and make it worse for others. She's not going to be one of those. I still want to throw her husband down the stairs. Anyways, in summary, it is a personal journey. 
And what, and I hope the message you got is that what works for one person does not necessarily work for another, but you really need to be aware there's a lot of options out there. And it's not just complementary therapy, there's topicals, or there's other oral therapies to consider. And that the good news is, and I'm happy happy to report, like even after five years, I'm seeing more research in the area specific to bleeding disorders. So that means that people are getting more interest in it and that we're seeing results that will help direct how we manage pain and give you options. So whatever therapy you're thinking of, you need to balance that risk benefit. You need to have that conversation with your treatment center provider and say, you know, I'm thinking about this. What do you think about it? And like, let's have a conversation and figure out if it's an option to consider but you always need to make sure that they're where you should never do it without their okay or input and then make sure as we all know there are experts out there and you want to find the right people to do the right thing you don't want some acupuncturist off the street you want someone who's certified and they are certified and so are massage therapists and as we know there's good nurses and not so good nurses (laughs) There's good therapy and I, the list could go on. You have to find somebody that works for you. So having said that, I hope that I have opened up your mind to ideas beyond the traditional thought of how we manage pain with pills, that there are, pardon? And that is the biggest challenge we have. And I think, and I agree with you. So what she's saying is insurance doesn't cover a lot of this stuff, but that is slowly changing. And it's something that we need to work for or advocate for. And I think that's a a good point to make. And I agree with you, but it doesn't mean you you have to consider it as an option. And and, well, people, hey, I want to try cannabis. That costs money. (laughs) Insurance isn't covering it yet. All right. But you you have to think about that, but you're right. But there are some, um, as an example, massage and acupuncture, it's out there. My two daughters have it covered. They're getting therapy for it, you know, whatever their issues are, because it is covered. So it's slowly changing. But keep in mind that there's other stuff out there. So have I wowed you? Yeah. Y'all look like you kind of stayed awake. Anyone have any questions? Right. Celebrex is a COX-2 non-steroidal that has the lowest risk of bleeding with. And and is that helping? Okay. Typically, you have to take it pretty consistently. The other thing, uh, does anyone ever remember taking Vioxx? Did you ever take Vioxx? Good drug, wasn't it? It was awesome. Worked better than Celebrex. They actually took it off the market because it had a high risk of cardiovascular uh, uh, disease events like heart attacks, strokes, and things like that. Um, There's actually a clinical trial ongoing right now. What's that? I'm sorry, but I deal with this every day. Um, But I like the drug. It worked for my patients. So I was like, we talked about the risk benefit and it's like, all right, we're going to keep going with this. But there is a company that has brought it back as orphan status and they're doing a clinical trial specific to bleeding disorders with Vioxx. So there is an opportunity that it might come back on a limited basis for people with bleeding disorders. And I think that's a big plus. But again, it still runs the risk as we get older. You know, it's not the best option. So as we're getting older and this population in this room is older than the ones I did get an hour ago, we need to think of alternative ways because there's going to be a point where you can't take Motrin. It, the risk is, is too high. Okay. And you know, there's a product coming out that's supposed to be longer acting factor seven. It's coming down the pipe. Did you know that? Yeah. Isn't that going to be awesome? You know, so would everybody else, but um, it would be an interesting conversation to have with your treatment center. If she's topped up enough, would she be safe to take NSAIDs on limited basis? It, you'd have to have that conversation. They may or may not run with it. And again, everybody's different, right? I can't answer that for you. My, my job here is to open you up to opportunities and conversations. So 
thanks a lot for your time. My email was up there, um, but it's my last name, first initial at hotmail.com. Um, and if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer. And thank you for your time. Thank you.